Welcome to worship this Maundy Thursday of Holy Week 2022. I'm glad you're able to be here with us. I know some individuals are still choosing to worship with us from home, so we are going to make a video of this evening's worship service available online as well. As we engage in our worship together this evening, I want to make you aware that we'll be taking communion this evening using the pre-prepared elements that are in the basket in the middle of the room. So if you didn't pick up one of those, please do. As we worship together this week, we'll be gathering this evening and then tomorrow at noon for Good Friday worship here in the sanctuary, which will be a service of prayer and scripture reading. And then we'll be gathering on Easter Sunday morning at 6 a.m. for our sunrise worship, hopefully outdoors. If you choose to join us for that service, please dress warmly. We'll also be gathering at 10.30 here in the sanctuary on Easter for worship as well. Again, all of our services are also being recorded and broadcast later on. This evening, as we engage in worship, I invite you to stand with me for our call to worship. On this day, Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. On this day, Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. On this day, Christ took a towel and washed his disciples' feet, giving us an example that we should do to others as he has done to us. On this day, Christ our God gave us this holy feast, that we eat this bread and drink this cup, may here proclaim his holy sacrifice and be partakers of his resurrection, and that the last day we remain with him in heaven. I invite you to join with me in our first hymn.
morning, as we gather to worship, as we gather to pray, as the sun sets and we are gathering in a place that will soon be dark, I invite you to join me in prayer before we read scripture. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you on this Maundy Thursday, the beginning of the climactic events of Holy Week, realizing that so long ago, over the next several hours, things dramatically changed for our Lord. We ask that as you prepare our hearts to hear scripture, to reflect upon its meaning to us as your disciples, as you prepare our hearts to come to this table and be fed and have our thirst quenched, as we acknowledge the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place and in this time with us and with all believers, we also, Lord, acknowledge that tonight there are those who have yet to know you. There are those who have yet to hear of you. And we ask, Lord, that your truth lie heavy upon our hearts, so that from this day moving forward, when the opportunity presents itself, through the equipping of your Holy Spirit, you will guide us to respond in ways that show forth the love of God to all people and invite others to know you as we do, as our Lord who loves each one of us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your abundant and amazing grace and ask that your spirit be present with us as we seek to know you more. We ask this all giving thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. I invite you this evening to hear our first reading from the Gospel of John. We're we'll reading to you John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, Jesus poured water into a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For Jesus knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, Jesus put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I invite you to remain seated as we lift our voice in song.
continue to hear the account of the Last Supper from the Gospel of John. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it happens, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which one of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon and Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, Jesus gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus had said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. For the Gospel of John, the focus of what we now honor on Monday Thursday is not the supper that was served. It's not the Passover. It's not even the lessons that Jesus spoke to them. But the focus for the Gospel of John is on this act of foot washing, an act that is unusual for our culture and tradition in our modern life, but for this time in history was a very natural daily activity. When you entered into someone's home, you washed your feet because they were dirty. As many cultures remove their shoes when they enter someone's home, or as many of us have a mat at the front door to wipe your feet, it was traditional to cleanse one's feet after traveling on the dirty road before you entered someone's home, especially if it was for a meal. But the unique way here that Jesus has changed the meaning of his action is usually you washed your own feet. If you were lucky enough to be invited to a household that was wealthy enough to have servants, maybe a servant washed your feet. Or maybe a servant provided the towel and the basin of water, but you still washed your own feet. For the 12 disciples, they had probably never had someone else wash their feet. They are humble men. They are not wealthy or well-to-do. They are not political or religious leaders yet. They are not notable. They're notable to us. But in their time and place, they are not yet famous. One would say they're nobody special. They've probably never had anyone wash their feet other than maybe their parents when they were very young. So in the midst of this Passover Seder, this meal in the upper room, the sharing of familiar prayers and scripture readings, the singing of psalms, a meal that felt festive and normal for that time of year and for men of that faith, it's interrupted when Jesus, acting as their host, stands up from the meal quite abruptly and unexpectedly, interrupting the flow of the religious liturgy that's being engaged in. And he removes his outer garments, he ties a towel around his waist, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Not only is this the inappropriate kind of flow of the evening, it strikes them that Jesus is choosing to do this. They've already arrived, they've already sat down and began the meal and celebrating the High Holy Day. To wash one's feet now seems out of place because they've already traipsed all the dirt in or potentially already washed their own feet when they had entered. Now Jesus interrupts the meal. And at first,
First Peter protests. You may remember Peter throughout scripture tends to be the one who points out kind of the obvious questions. Peter's the one who talks about other people claiming who Jesus is. Some people say you're a prophet. Some people say you're you know, the rebirth of some great person from the past. Some people even say you're the Messiah. Or in the transfiguration when Peter's the one who says, well, there's important people here, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Maybe I should build some tents or some houses for you to stay in. He kind of can't deal with the pregnant pauses, the kind of empty space. He wants to fill it with questions and feel heard and affirmed that he's paying attention. So again, Peter's the one who speaks out. He says, Lord, why are you washing our feet? Now the question makes sense because we've already started the meal. We've potentially already washed our feet at the doorway. Now we're engaged in the meal. So Peter says, Jesus, why now are you washing our feet? Because it's the wrong time to do it. And then kind of deeper in that question is, Jesus, why are you washing our feet? Why are you the host of this meal? Our rabbi, our teacher, our mentor, our friend, the one who we've already identified as the promised Messiah, why are you acting as a servant? And Jesus responds, he tells him this has nothing to do with keeping you clean. He said, this is not about bathing with water. He said, I know your feet are already clean. So we can infer they already washed their feet when they entered this dinner space. He said, I'm not washing your feet because you are physically outwardly dirty. He said, I'm washing your feet because this is an act of service. Because I'm humbling myself before you. And I want you to act as I am acting. This is an act of service, of humility, of love, of care, of compassion. It's visible and tangible and tactile. I'm engaging in something, Jesus says, that requires me to kneel before you, to touch your body, and to enact with you something that is familiar. You wash your feet every time you come in the house. It's a daily ritual, and I'm now going to engage in it with you. Because Jesus says, I want you to do this for others. I want you to daily engage in the care and hospitality and service of others. And when Peter hears that answer, he says, great, now wash all of me. How about all of it? If you're really going to say that you're going to humble yourself before me, Lord, give me a full portion of that humility. And Jesus thankfully pushes back a bit and says, that's unnecessary. In other words, Peter, you're, you're getting ahead of yourself. The engagement here is that I'm going to do something. Jesus, I want you to follow my example. So for the Gospel of John, the framing of the Last Supper is about this action of love. The fact that Jesus interrupts the meal to do this act of service. He interrupts the meal to do something unexpected. There's many unexpected things that happen in this meal. But the first one is an act of love and generosity. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, I want you to do this too. And we know sitting at that table is Judas who will betray him. But at this point, that betrayal hasn't happened. And at this point, he has not been identified as the betrayer. And Jesus knowingly washes his feet as well. Then the meal continues. And then Jesus lifts up that someone at the table will betray him. And again, the conversation and chatter on the table is who? Who will betray him? And again, Peter pipes up and nudges the person sitting right next to Jesus to ask him. You're right next to him. Ask him who's going to betray him. And the disciple right next to Jesus obliges and asks. And Jesus says, the next person that I serve the bread to. Again, another act of service as the host who usually would preside over the meal, who wouldn't serve anything or prepare anything or wash anyone's feet, the person who should be in charge, I will serve the meal. And the next person I serve it to will be the one who betrays me. And even when he does that and says out loud, this is what's happening, scripture tells us the other 11 at the table were confused by that and said, well, he can't mean that, Jesus, that Judas is going to betray him. He must just mean, well, I have something for Judas to do next. But Judas fully understands. The brokenness, the temptation of sin has already entered into him. And he gets up from the table and leaves. 
And for the Gospel of John, the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup is overshadowed by these actions of humility and service and love. By this interaction between Judas and Jesus, it's again an act of service, of outreach, of humility, of compassion, only to be met still with this betrayal. But scripture highlights for us that it wasn't Judas betraying Jesus. Depending on what translation you read, evil or Satan, you know, the spirit of darkness entered Judas at that moment. And then he took action to leave that table and betray Jesus. This is still a conflict between Jesus and the power of sin, not between Jesus and the human Judas. He is the instrument that is used to fulfill God's plan but it's Jesus against the power of evil. And then the evening gets dark. When we come to this table, often on a Sunday morning, it's kind of with a sense of celebration and thanksgiving and remembrance, looking back at what God has done for us, looking at ourselves and saying, what do I need? Am I hungry? Am I thirsty? What do I need to feel satisfied, to feel like I've encountered God, to know that the Spirit is here? It kind of focuses on us. I'm grateful because God has done something for me. Or I'm coming to this table praising God for what God has done around me and for people in my life. Or I'm simply coming to this table because it feels good to do something familiar, something I've grown up doing, something that I've done in every place that I've worshipped. It's a comforting activity. And sometimes we push out of our minds the discomfort that must have existed at that first table. The fact that when the disciples gathered at that table, things were thrown off kilter. Not only were their expectations not met, not only was their ritual that they basically had memorized from childhood interrupted, but their rabbi, their teacher, their leader has now said, no, I am your servant. And you are to serve others as I have served you. And you are to love others as God has loved you. And you are to Keep doing this and remember what it means. We have just finished reading through the book of Exodus. And after the Passover, the very first Passover happens, God's command to the people is remember the Passover. Every single year, retell this story. Make sure the youngest person at the table, at the Seder meal, asks questions. And that youngest person is given the answers as to what God has done to free us what God has done for our ancestors, and how God has prepared us for what lies ahead with the protection, with the safety, with the land we're going to inherit, with the food and water we needed, with the boundaries we needed to make our community safe and productive. Remember. It's a command from God to remember. And now Jesus, remembering the Passover at this same meal, says to his disciples, remember what I'm saying at this meal. Remember what I am doing at this meal and keep doing it. Add to your Passover story. Add to your Seder traditions. Come to the table, break the bread, share the cup, tell the story of God's intervention to save God's people, and then tell people what God has done through Jesus at this table tonight. Build upon that story, that legacy for the people of faith. And we are now doing that almost 2,000 years later as we continue to tell that story and build on that familiar encounter and make it real to us, make it satisfying to us so that we have something to give thanks for, to celebrate, to remember, but also to remind ourselves, hold ourselves accountable to the truth that this meal is not supposed to always be comforting, warm, and hospitable. Part of coming to this table is feeling a little bit of that discomfort, that dis-ease, that questioning. Is this really what's going to happen? Is this really what's supposed to happen? What is God teaching me at this table? Why did Jesus have to change the meaning of something so familiar? And now that it's become familiar to us, how can we allow it to challenge us to feel enough different? enough off kilter, enough uneasy, that it stirs us, that the Spirit works within us so that we can leave this celebration, this thanksgiving, this remembrance with a challenge. 
to go out different because of it. Jesus said to his disciples, one of you is going to betray me. And they had no idea which one. Which leads us to understand that Judas was not a bad guy. Judas was not the usual suspect. They didn't all turn and point at him immediately and say, it must be him. Even after he was identified, they couldn't reconcile what Jesus was saying. So is Jesus combating, confronting, coming face to face with the power of evil, preparing himself to then be betrayed and arrested and to willingly lay down his life to triumph over evil, to conquer the power of death. But at that table, the disciples do not yet fully understand. They know things are different. They know that makes them unsettled and uncomfortable. Yet they stay and celebrate even when Judas gets up and leaves. And then scripture tells us after that meal, the disciples join Jesus in prayer in the garden. They're trying to reconcile what's happening. They're juggling this change, this difference, this unsettling. But they still want to be there. They still feel included. And they know that this is important. And Jesus' command to them is be in this moment, but also remember and prepare. Very similar to the command that God gave through Moses to the people. Prepare for the Passover. Then live into it. And then remember it and commemorate it and pass it on to future generations. So we're called to do that same thing. And for the Gospel of John, the focus as to what you should remember and pass on is an amazing act of humility, of service, this act of love to others. We should take away from this table much more than the bread and the cup, much more than the memory and the story of what happened, but this call to action, that moving forward in obedience to what Christ said at this table, we are going to serve others, we're going to love others, and we're going to include everyone in our acts of love and service, even those who may betray us, even those who are going to give into temptation, even those who are going to sin. And it's not even those like they're a small group of people. That means everyone, you and I, all of us at some point, will give into that temptation and sin. And yet we're all included and invited to this table. And we're all encouraged to offer that invitation, that hospitality, those acts of love. To those around us. So as we prepare our hearts to come to this table this evening, let's be aware that as we approach this table, it's meant to bring us comfort and joy. It's meant to sustain us and prepare us, but it's also meant to stir within us a bit of discomfort as we acknowledge the fact that our Lord has to humble himself, lay down his own life so that you and I can live forever. Amen.
this evening as we approach this table, we acknowledge and remember that the disciples who gathered at this table had walked with Jesus for three years, witnessing miracles, healings, resurrections, exorcisms, encountering this amazing healing, this abundance of love. They'd witnessed Jesus welcome people, even children, into his midst. They watched him interact with foreigners, with those who were considered unclean and untouchable. They saw him be followed by crowds of people who were eager just to hear him speak and to witness what he had said and done. They also saw him engage with religious and political leaders, sometimes with points of friction at the challenge of their questions. They saw him respond to invitations and inquiries from people who desired just to be near him, just to touch him, just to touch his cloak. They witnessed abundance of hospitality and love and grace and mercy. At the same time, they had questions and doubts. They argued amongst themselves about his identity, about the importance even of themselves, and which one of them might be the greatest disciple. In this time and journeying with him and all that they witnessed, they still were trying to reconcile what their part was and what Jesus was doing. And in coming to this table, the culmination of those three years, Jesus gathers his disciples, even the one who will betray him. And he acknowledges that what they have done has led to this moment. And the lesson he has for them in this moment is a lesson of humility and service and hospitality and love and welcome and forgiveness, even for the one at that table who will give in to the temptation to sin, who will allow evil to overtake him and allow him to betray our Lord. Jesus says to us as his disciples, you too can come to this table. You too who have heard the stories and witnessed you who have your own personal testimony and have heard from others about what God has done, you who have also given into temptation and sin, you who have allowed evil into your life at times or have encountered evil in others, you are invited to this table to remember, to celebrate, to give thanks, but also to prepare and to look forward and to be sustained knowing that we are all welcome here and we're called here so that we then can mimic what God has done for us and share that abundant grace and love with others. Please join me in prayer. Creator God, as we come to this table seeking a meal set before us by our Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit is here with us. We thank you for the brothers and sisters in Christ gathered in this room, those gathered in congregations across our world this holy week. We ask, Lord, that you bless all those who desire to know your presence. We ask that your Holy Spirit be present in this place, in this time of worship, but also in our everyday lives. We ask, Lord, as we share this bread and cup, that you remind us what you have done. That you allow us in this present moment to celebrate what you are doing now. And that you prepare us for what you still are calling us to do. Lord, we thank you for the honesty and truth of scripture that challenges us, that tells the hard stories, that allows us to understand just how human the disciples are. We thank you for the incarnation, for Jesus Christ, fully human and fully divine, understanding what it is to come to this table and to sit with someone who would betray him, to sit with those who were confused by him, to sit with those who would challenge him, to sit with those who would recline against him, just so comfortable to be in his presence. Lord, we ask that as we approach this table, that your spirit fills our hearts with wonder, as well as setting us a little bit off kilter, so that we aren't too comfortable in your presence, but we are challenged and held to account and called to fulfill what you have commanded us to do, to love God and to love others. We ask as we approach this table that you bless us and sustain us. 
And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. On that night, in the meal that Christ interrupted with the washing of feet, he broke bread and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And each time you eat of this, you do so in remembrance of me. At that same meal where they sang psalms and said prayers together, Jesus poured out the cup and said, this cup is sealed in my blood as a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. And each time you drink of it, you're preparing for my promised return. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We're invited to come and consume, but also to remember, to give thanks, to prepare, and to acknowledge that we are called to this place in this time for God's purpose. And from this moment moving forward, God will sustain us. I invite you now to partake in the bread and the cup. God, we came to this table seeking to know you more. We thank you. As we come to this table, we are connected with believers near and far, across time, place, and even technology. We thank you, Lord, that this familiar, traditional, religious practice has sustained Christians for generations. We thank you that this tradition even harkens back to the original Passover and to our faith ancestors who heard you speak through Moses. We thank you, Lord, for thousands of years of faithful people who know about the one true God. We thank you that we now know about you as revealed in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your spirit that continues to equip us, your disciples, as we continue to live into your promises and acknowledge that one day we will be united with you again at your promised return for our entry into your heavenly kingdom. We thank you, Lord, this evening and always for sustaining us, for remembering us, for preparing us, and for acknowledging us as those who are co-laborers with you in your ministry of love to all people. We give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs> God, we come this evening knowing that the world is not a world that is at peace. We come knowing that there are wars, that there is illness, that there is fear and anxiety, that there is unease and there is brokenness around us. We lift up to you all those in distress and we ask for your comfort and peace. We lift up to you all who are hurting and ask that you bring wholeness. We lift up before you all those who are fighting and struggling those who are just pushing back and being challenging. Lord, may they relent. May they work to reconcile. 
May your spirit rejuvenate and refresh within each one of us a desire to show hospitality and welcome and inclusion. God, we are thankful for the example of Christ who washed the feet of his disciples, including the one who would betray him, who shared this meal, not only with his disciples 2,000 years ago, but also with every disciple since. We ask, Lord, that you hold us accountable to show forth the same sort of love. Guide us to show grace and mercy and welcome, even to those who we don't understand, even to those who make us upset, even to those who betrayed us and hurt us. And Lord, at the same time, may we receive that grace and mercy and love from those we have hurt or wounded, from those we have betrayed, from those we have forgotten and ignored. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your love. Guide us by your teaching. Allow us to live into your holy word. Sustain us by your spirit and remind us that we are your disciples. Hear us now as we pray in one voice the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we lift our voices in song. rejuvenated, reconciled, filled with everything that you need to now go out into darkness, to now go out into a world who in the next several hours will betray our Lord, will arrest him, will put him on trial, will beat him, and tomorrow will kill him even though he is innocent. This evening is preparing us for the most difficult hours ahead. May we give thanks and remember that we are prepared to encounter the amazing truth of Christ's willingness to die for each one of us. And then may we be in that moment of darkness as we continue to prepare and reflect 
for the joy of the empty tomb. Go out into this evening with the blessings of God, our creator, the knowledge of Jesus as our Messiah. Go out knowing that the Holy Spirit's comforting presence is always with us. I invite you to be seated and to listen to the music as we remove all decoration from our sanctuary. At the end of doing so, you are welcome to remain in silent prayer for as long as you need this evening. May we be seated. <clears throat> 